in Greece, in France, in Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, in Ireland, and in Britain, there have been massive actions of people against austerity. That is the central political issue. In France, Italy, Portugal, Spain, I hope I'm not leaving anyone out, there have been general strikes. In Italy, four. In Greece, seven. General strike is when everything stops. The one in France, which, which I was uh, connected to a little bit, was remarkable. The phone didn't work. You turned on the electricity, but it didn't go on. Everything stopped. The working class was saying to the government, and that was their slogan, you brought this crisis, we will not pay for it. But we're not in Europe. We're here. And we haven't had anything like that. We had something here in the schools, the public higher education here in California that gave hope to many people around the country, but that's really all. So I want to say that there is a way to fight against this. The Europeans, very clear, tax the rich, tax the corporations. Solution, stop. That could be a solution in this country also. Even your sister state, for those of you who do not know it, in Oregon, was remarkable in what it did. In 2009, the legislature passed a bill there saying we're not going to make the cuts that California, our sister state, are made. We're not make any cuts in public services. We're going to solve the problem with millions of dollars of debt in the state by taxing the rich and taxing corporations. That's what they did. Everybody earning over $250,000 had to pay much more in, uh, in Oregon, and those earning over $500,000 had to pay still more. And the two sides squared off. And in the middle of January, 1.2 million Oregonian citizens went to the polls and soundly supported the law. The business community was defeated. And Oregon didn't go the way others did. I mention it only because even in our country, where we do not have the organizations that make these events in Europe, Europe has still powerful trade unions, strong socialist, communist, green parties, and so on, that have organizations that can pull people out to make a statement about national policy. We don't have that anymore. We're going to have to create that. Otherwise, we will not be able to even mount the opposition that in, that in Europe is making a very big difference. There's more political action in Europe of a progressive sort than there has been for decades. Not only that, for the first time, on the 29th of September, they had an all-Europe action in which in every country, even little countries, countries that don't normally participate, participated. Some of you might like to know that on the 29th of September, when there were actions against austerity in every European country, a trade union organization in Poland joined called Solidarity. From one role it played 20 years ago to a very different role it has to play now. If Solidarity could come all that distance, then there must be hope even for us in the United States. Let me conclude then by trying to answer a question implicit in everything I've said about where we're going and what could be done. First, where we're going, and I, I cannot find sugary terms to coat this. The United States is becoming a fundamentally economically divided society. It's been going on for a long time. The worst of it was postponed by the work and borrowing between the 70s and the crisis. That's gone, that's over. We're now seeing what? Our corporations, have, our leading corporations, have already figured this out. For 30 years, they've been moving production out of the United States to the rest of the world. They now understand that the future growth of consumption of the market for what they produce is also outside the United States. The United States is no longer where the game is to be played. Therefore, when you say to yourself, as I'm sure some of you do, how can this continue? Because after all, the corporations need people to have the wherewithal to buy what they produce. 
The answer is, no, they don't. They're looking for buyers elsewhere, and they're finding them elsewhere. Indeed, they're finding them particularly in the places to which they move production, because that's where the income is rising, and that's where the future of their buying is. The United States is no longer necessary the way it was. That we have more and more people that are kind of marginal, they really don't have jobs, or if they do, the jobs are temporary, have very few benefits, are insecure. Who cares? They can't buy? Of course they can't buy. But that's not where the growth is right now. It's in other parts of the world. So the United States' working class is going to come to look like a lot of working classes in a lot of other countries a core that do real well in the big cities, and then a mass of people living in all senses of the term in another universe, in another set of circumstances, with very little connection and a nice army of police to keep the gap between them from being crossed. There are a hundred signs that we're going in that direction. That's what all these cuts of social programs, cuts of the public universities. Let me stop for a minute and just say to you, I have been teaching economics in America's leading universities all my adult life. If there's anything we all agree on, it's the following. The world is now a competitive place. The United States is going to have to struggle to find its place and be an important economy in the world. And the most important factor will be the quantity and the quality of the labor force that we bring to bear to be competitive. Okay, let's ask the question. Where is the trained labor force trained in this country? Roughly 15 million people go to colleges and universities in the United States now. Out of that, under 3 million go to private schools. The other 12 million go to public higher education. One of the biggest victims in this crisis of funding is public higher education education. To bail capitalism out of this crisis, we are, as a society, shooting ourselves in the foot. That only makes sense if the corporations for whom this is a matter of life and death have already programmed a different scenario. They're going to produce around the world, they're going to sell where the markets are, and the United States is not a major factor in their calculations. And that portends a, a long-term decline for the American working class for which this country's culture and politics and history have not prepared our people. They're going to be very upset, very angry, very eager to find suitable scapegoats. That is a dangerous situation, to put the nicest term on it, that I can think of. Nothing is being done that I can identify to prevent what I just said from unfolding. It seems to be the direction everyone is going. It's what your governor, and I don't mean to single him out, it's basically what he's laying out for you. Unemployment's high, your jobs are insecure, taxes are being increased and levied on you, and social services that you need are being withdrawn. Hello, that means your private resources are dwindling and your public supports are dwindling alongside. What is going on here? How long does this have to happen before the American people do something other than individual violence? Well, conclusion, alternative. Well, allow me here to end as follows. I think there is a basic problem beyond this or that policy and government employment or what the banks do. I don't think the culprit in this story are employers or bankers or Goldman Sachs or Bush or Obama. I don't. I just don't. Indeed, what I see as I look at this crisis unfolding and the government's lame, ineffective response, I see everybody doing pretty much what this system calls upon them to do. And I draw a conclusion from that. 
It's not this or that group, it's the system. And I want to end by talking about the system and not to observe, in fact, to proudly smash the taboo of the last half century in America that capitalism is the name of this system and that capitalism is the problem and that the end of capitalism is a reasonable solution and one that ought to be discussed rather than swept under the rug as if we can fix it and correct it and reform it. You know, I listened to Mr. Obama with respect. I listened to Mr. Bush, period. Um, <laughs> and, and I hear both of them talk about reform. I find it un unbelievable. The last time this country's economy collapsed, 75 years ago, and, and just a footnote again as an economist, we had a collapse of our capitalist system in the 1930s. It collapsed in October of 1929, and we never got out of it for 10 years. And when we did get out of it, it wasn't an economic policy that got us out of it. All of the economic policies that were trial failed to get us out of it. What got us out of it was we solved the unemployment problem in a different way. We took half the people who were unemployed and put them in a uniform, and the other half in a factory to produce the guns and the uniforms. We managed it that way. We went to war. Between the end of the Great Depression and the end of World War II, 1945, and the beginning of this crisis, we had 11 other economic downturns. Capitalism is a stunningly unstable economic system. I used to tell my students, in order to put some humor in an otherwise frightening lecture, that if you lived with a person as unstable as capitalism, you'd either demand they get professional help or move out. <laughs> but you accept in your economic system, and you don't demand an equivalent or parallel response. And here we are in another collapse. At the last great collapse in the 1930s, reforms were put through, all kinds. You mustn't do this, you must do that, you have to do this, you have to do that. We didn't have a social security system before the Great Depression. That was put in to help people because they were unable to cope. We didn't have an unemployment insurance system in this country before the Great Depression. That also was a fr fruit of that, as were many other things. We reformed and we fixed. We said investment banks cannot do the same business as a depository bank. We put a wall between them, something some of you know as the Glass-Steagall Act. And what happened? No sooner were those reforms passed than the corporate governance of this American private capitalism went to work to evade those reforms, to weaken those reforms, and when it was possible, to repeal them. You know, the first time you pass reforms and the corporate sector undoes them, shame on them. The second time, what, have you not learned anything? Here's our problem. We allow the economic decisions in our society to be made by a very small group of people. Every part of our economic system is basically organized in the form of corporations. Small independent businesses depend on those corporations. Corporations are run by a small group of people. They're called a board of directors. They typically have 15 to 20 people. They are selected by the major shareholders, another group of 15 to 20 people. Hundreds of employees, thousands of employees, tens of thousands of employees come to work Monday to Friday, nine to five. They come there, they do the work. They make it all possible but they have absolutely nothing to say about what is produced, how it's produced, where it's produced, and what is done with the profits of the production. Those decisions are made by the people who run the corporations. They decided not to pay rising wages anymore in the 1970s. They decided to support and invest in speculative investments that made no sense. They made the key decisions and most of all, they got rid of the reforms. And we're going to map a new set of reforms? They're just going to do it faster this time because they've had a lot of practice.